as we get back into our YN spotlight that we talked about doing, uh, we have had some great YNs in, and uh, we're going to continue on with that pace today with uh, Mr. Ethan Opdahl. Um, Ethan is coming live from the basement. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, where are you coming from? I'm coming from the dining room. Um, <laughs> live from the dining the room. The dining room. So I picked I picked the dining room this time because of the, a little nice background here. Nice. Yeah. I saw cool. how you snuck the little St. Gaudens. Uh, oh, is that? Right. I like my it. Signa- it's my signature piece from, um, I think Keith Dewald put it together. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, very, you know, I love the, 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 the dining set there too. It looks nice. You got your little, uh, you got your little noodle make, you got your little noodle pot beh- behind you. That's really cool. Strictly for show. These haven't seen any food yet. Oh, think. okay. All right. All right. <laughs> That's cool. So, um, Ethan, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. What got you involved in coins and, um, you know, what, what got you to be, you know, I feel like um, with some of the younger guys we've met, uh, you've got guys who are really interested in certain types of coins. Uh, they're really laser focused on certain types. Um, you seem to be a little bit more on the buying collection side of it, which is kind of something that I w- I'm a big fan of. Um, learn them all, right? Um, try to figure out how to, how to figure out how to buy everything um, at a number and have, a, and have a, someone waiting uh, to be able to sell that too for liquidity. So tell us a little bit about your journey and tell us a bit about how you got here. Yeah, um, I'm 22 years old. Uh, I live in Rockville, Maryland, soon going to be living in Washington, D.C. Uh, I think like most people my age and most people of all ages um, who are doing coins, they get into it from a family member or maybe a family friend. Of course. I just happen to be digging through my grandfather's drawers um, and coming across, you know, one of those conglomerations of pre-1964 silver Um, and some dental gold because my grandpa's a dentist. So we had all this, all these old yucky teeth. Um, And of course that was very fascinating to me. I absolutely love gold on teeth, but even more so, I think it was um, the coins that were in that drawer. Nothing incredibly fancy, um, just mostly your walking Liberty half dollars, Washington quarters, Roosevelt dimes. Um, But funny enough, there was a 1911 Denver barber quarter, maybe a a semi key date, but it was very fine and turned out to be worth, I don't know, about three or $400. And I thought to myself, you know, this isn't the oldest coin here. Um, This doesn't look like the fanciest coin here, the biggest coin here, the most silver. Why is this one worth the most? And of course you go into your 1964 Yeoman um, coin book that's located in the drawer. (laughs) You say, what what is this thing? Why, Why is this quarter the best one here? It makes no sense. And then, you know, by the end of the afternoon, you're halfway through the book and you're like, why do I love these, these things, these coins so much? Um, and it's an addiction as we all, we all kind of know, it makes no sense, but it makes all the sense in the world. Um, and I think from there, I started collecting on and off, um, negotiating between coins and school and sports. Um, but I think, as you mentioned, buying coin collections and and seeing fresh coin collections that were either conglomerations put away long before PCGS and MGC, but also some things that were put together in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. um, It's amazing to see fresh coin collections that have never been seen before and discovering things that um, have never been seen before. It's really what I am very passionate about. Well, yeah, that's awesome. So, but but what drew you to coins? What was it? Was it the value? Was it the coins themselves? Like, t- tell me a little bit more about how you, you know, was admiring them from a distance to wanting to do them, you know, as yeah. a job or a hobby. Definitely. Um, I think a lot of people are in coins for the history. And I certainly see the historical aspect of it, being able to tie a particular coin that you're looking to, looking at to a particular time in history, maybe an 1803 large cent to the Louisiana purchase or a colonial Massachusetts coin to that period of time. Um, But as I go forward in coins now, it really is the artistic kind of mastery of those sculptors who are putting together the dyes and the toning and the blast away coins that really attracts me. And I just love to look at coins and and see coins, whether they're crusty or whether they're, you know, fully white. Um, I think the artwork is what draws me in now. And also the markets that kind of revolve around coins are really fascinating to me. Right. Have you gotten um, into world coins at all? Like, so I would say some of the more modern, um, modern world coins, or even some of the foreign coins, uh, you know, that were, you know, that were money, just like our money, um, that is highly collectible. Are you, are you strictly US? Or are you kind of dabbling in other things as well? Yeah, I think my knowledge base is probably, I would consider strictly from the United States, maybe coins and a little bit of currency. 
Um, but as you know, there's research that can be done into all these different kinds of coins, given the information that's out there today. So, you know, I've had the opportunity to deal with some late 16th century for Scudos, and very recently a JP Morgan, um, Farouk pedigreed eight reels. So I'm fascinated by those coins, but I found that it's very hard for me to wrap my head around both the United States and the world market right. um, and at least claim to be a pro at all of them. When in reality, I think it's more in the United States end. Right. So what are you a pro at? <laughs> I would say I'm not a pro at anything um, compared to you and your brother. Um, you guys are just the best of the best watching these, these podcasts and these videos and your Instagram and the knowledge, um, the customer base, the people that you work with and deal with. Um, so when I watch your videos, I say, I'm certainly not a pro, um, but I like to really try to stay up to date and knowledge of the markets. Um, I try to understand how to grade, even though I'm almost always a point off. Um, so I'm certainly not an expert grader. Higher or lower? Are you high or low? Well, of course, when they're my coins, I'm a point high. Of course. And, when they're, <laughs> and when they're somebody else's coins, I seem to be a little bit more accurate. Um, but as you know, you're so you're one so you're a standard coin dealer. Then that's that's uh, that's pretty much standard throughout the market, right? <laughs> I, I just know my my own coins are going to go 68, and they just come back 67. But it's it's okay. Yeah, I feel like uh, even when you get further on, you still feel the same way. Because I I mean, I um I can still say that when I look at paper money or I look at coins, I I I always look at it at a point where. If I'm buying it in, then I'm going to be very critical, like every little fold or every mark on the surface. Um, but when it's mine, that's totally different. Yeah, we want to exactly. get the we want to get the most money for it, and we want to take care of our customers. But yeah, but you got to also to you got to be careful, right? You want to be accurate. Like right. you don't you don't you don't want to mm -hmm. get you don't want people to think that you got that you're buying at a point lower when you're buying it and then you're asking more money when you sell it, because that's a little, yeah, then they won't sell it to you. Well, people are coming, you know, and, and, and something that you're going to, you're going to run into Ethan, as you get, um, as you, as you, you know, travel around and buy more deals is that people are going to start looking at you as knowing more than them. You know, you'll be go, you'll go into coin shops and you'll know more than probably everybody at that coin shop if you do it the right way. And the best way to get traction and to buy a lot of product is to be accurate. If you can prove yourself to be accurate and make a small margin over that accurate grade or that accurate market, you know, understanding, uh, you're gonna find you're gonna find yourself at the top of a lot of people's phone call list whenever they buy fresh deals, right? It's that accuracy every time, um, being on the money and being confident and being on the money um, and being able to make that decision very fast, very concise, and uh, you know, be ready to pay on the spot. Um, so. Yeah, that's good that you're, you know, a little bit higher. And there and there is instances where you want to be a little bit higher on things that are super rare or something that's really nice for the type or really nice for the rarity. And right. and for that reason I get it. But overall, as you know, when you buy deals, there's very few really choice coins and in, in deals that come over across the counter. That's what we experience here. Yeah. Um you'll have, you know, a nice deal that comes in that's got your, you know, kind of what you mentioned before. You know, it's got your Whitman albums. It's got your couple rolls of Lincoln Cents or Buff uh, or a uh, Jefferson Nichols 50 D's or whatnot that were popular back then. You got a few, you know, Black Eagles and you know maybe a Wood Chopper and maybe a roughed up Indian. Um, you rarely get really really nice coins in those deals. So when you do, Absolutely. when you do, you have to be on the money, right? You've got to give that confidence to make sure that un that person understands you know what you're doing at some level, right? Absolutely. I think one of the main lessons that I've taken from your podcast, that was something that really hit home for me. I don't know in which podcast you mentioned it, but it's about, you know, being that expert when you're going to meet with somebody who has a coin collection and really giving them the confidence that you know what you're doing. I think you said in one of your podcasts, um, how, you know, when you call one person over to help you with a deal, and then you call another person over, you're almost telling the person who's meeting with you that you're not the guy. Yeah. I think that might have been the word that you're using. Yeah, you're not the guy. That's exactly <laughs> right. Very Good. frankly, in, in the midst of hearing that, I made a mistake probably about a week earlier. Um, I don't know if it will be one that I'll be able to recover from, um, but it was through text messaging and over the phone with somebody where I think I was asking for a little bit too much information before I went to see their collection and giving them the feeling, hey, is this the guy? You know, is he the right. one who yeah. knows what he's doing? And of course, I think I'm the guy. I know I'm the guy who can help them. 
Um, but they need to know that you're the person who's that expert. I mean, that's what we're here for. Yeah. I think. No, that's a good point. And, and honestly, you recognizing that is is going to is going to catapult you above a lot of people because a lot of people can't look at themselves in the mirror and uh, and say, hey, listen, I need to clean this up. I need to clean that up. Uh, they continue to use it as a ratio game. And, you know, if they win seven at a time, that they're happy with that. I, I just for me, I, that's just not how I roll. Right. I want right. to be perfect. I want to be a 10 out of 10. And if I'm missing something, then I want to do the homework to find out what I'm missing. Right. And I think that's important. Uh, it's very important for the young guys that are coming up in this is to kind of take, you know, try to try to listen to that and try to, you know, try to deal with it. I'm, I'm watching the situation from afar right now with a young, a young numismatist who's got himself in a quandary with a uh, package that was being shipped. And um, I gave him some advice and I told him to don't risk your reputation for any amount of money. Um, trying to stand on the pedestal as I'm right, I'm right. And I'm going to die on this hill being right. Um, I just think in this time, in this modern age with, you know, Google reviews and Instagram, uh, I mean, Facebook groups and things like that, it's easily to get outed, Yeah, right? It's very easy to get outed and there's just not, um, there's just not any price I'm willing to pay, uh, yeah. to be able to salvage my relationship. If something happens, that's out of my control. Um, then we've got to work together to try to figure out the best outcome of how to get this re resolution solved. Right. Yeah. Um, not responding and, and, right. you know, saying I'm right. And this has happened and I can, and you have to do it and you have to be quick to take care of the situation. You can't, yeah. you can't let days go by. You can't let weeks go by. No, it's a, uh, it's a right then and there you face it and you work past it and you keep moving. Yeah, so I agree. I agree. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of a couple hundred bucks, but someone's questioning your integrity. Right. Um, you know, I just, you know, some people you just can't deal with. You just, you know, you eat it and you don't deal with that person anymore. Right. Um, but, but you don't want to give them any reason to, to discount what you're doing or what you're trying to do or what you're trying to accomplish, especially at an early age. Right. Absolutely. So I'm glad you heard that part of the podcast because that's a very important part. I think a lot of people, they skip that. Right. Right. And if you're going to be the guy and purport yourself to be the guy, then you better know the guy answers, right? You better know, you better know that stuff off the top of your head because people right. are going to, their BS meter is going to come up really quick and they're going to know really, really fast if they feel like you're telling the truth or not. Right. I, I completely agree. I think, you know, so much of what you guys have in your podcast is gold. So there's a million things that I could pick out, but I think that's really the one that makes the most sense, especially I think a big piece of what I was wanting to discuss with you, because you do it at such a higher scale than I do it, um, is all of the factors that come with dealing with the public. Um, yeah. I've never in, I guess, my coin experience really had a lot of interest or fun, you know, doing dealer to dealer just because I, I enjoy so much of those fresh coins. Yeah. But when you're dealing with the public and going into people's homes or businesses and having them trust you to sit there, sometimes even alone with their coin collections, you need to be razor honest, razor sharp, make them feel very safe. Um, and, you know, people aren't always the most reasonable. I'm not always the most reasonable at times, but you really need to be able to, you know, just act with full ethics and honesty. And, and you know, in the event that you need to pay up for something because you know that it could get that higher grade and you want to be honest with them, um, or even maybe telling them, hey, I'm going to get this graded. If it grades this, I'm going to give you X amount more money. Um, I think it's really important. I was, I was really wanting to hear a lot about your experiences, you know, maybe one dealing with the public and some advice you have about that, but two, maybe some of the best coins and collections that have walked into your shop. Cause I think that's, that's the absolute most exciting thing to hear about. The coin shop podcast is brought to you by us coins and jewelry at uscoinsandjewelry.com, Your number one source for paper money watches and so much more. So make sure you check our website, uscoinsandjewelry.com. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to give you a really good, a really good piece of advice um, that for me is probably the most crucial when dealing with the public. And that is organization from the very beginning. When you sit down with a deal, let's just say they got three or four boxes of stuff. The yes. very first thing I do is clear the entire space off the desk. I don't want like, I don't need pen containers. I don't need, um, you know, stickers. I want everything clean from that desk when I bring their products on the, on the table to, to buy. And I'm going to take those four boxes and I'm going to sort them in a way where I can work right to left and look very organized doing so. And when buying coins from the public is... A lot, a lot of it is building consumer confidence before you even look at the coins. 
right? So that's making eye contact. That's trying to communicate with them and understand where the coin deal came from, who collected it. Because a lot of times it's not them that collected it. It's right. either an uncle that unfortunately passed away or a father or a grandfather or someone in the family that that left this coin collection and they've been burdened with it or they've had it in the, in the closet for X amount of years and they're really, really ready to sell it and move on from it. But they also want to feel very comfortable and very confident in what they're doing, right? And a lot of times they're speaking for two or three other family members or more, right? So the onus has been put on them to make a right the right decision. And the very first thing I can say, I believe that helps us get you know, that, that confidence is being able to organize it in a way that makes sense. Okay. Um, be very judicious with your pricing be very transparent with the pricing. Um, if, if you have a shop or if you understand the market giving bid ask, you know, saying, so look, uh, if it's like a GSA, you know, say for instance, yep. I think the market's like 310 on a pack right now. Say, okay, well mm -hmm. I'd pay, you know, 275 and I, and I sell them for 310 and, and giving them that understanding because the very first thing that people have a hard time with is understanding what the buy sell spread is. So yes. if you're buying gold Eagles and you're like, I'm going to pay you 1950 and I'm going to ask, you know, 2050. Well, I mean, that's a hundred bucks. That's like 5%. You, you should be able to make 5%, right? If you're giving them instant liquidity right then there on the spot, I think you're allowed to make 5%. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And that, to speak what Kenny just said, I, I just sat down, I sold a coin right before this podcast and uh, I went into the space. I sat down at one of my guys' desk, and he had stuff everywhere, rubber bands. You know, I think I, I I took the first two minutes and I organized the desk because it it just bothers me sitting down and there's stuff everywhere. They just have a certain way of doing things, and I don't like it. So I organized it. We did the deal, and and then also speaking to. You know, when you're walking into a situation at a bank or you're walking into uh, a, a coin deal where you're going to buy, um, it's just being consistent with your numbers. Definitely. You know, don't try to don't try to get out of line and try to buy something too cheap because you don't know how many bids that customer's already had. He, yep. he might say he might say he hasn't had a bid, but he might have had two or three bids that someone's already pulled coins out and he put them back. So you have to just you really get to gain that trust by being honest and being honest with the customer and, and give them that comfortable feeling that he's doing business with the right person. You know, and, and to speak to that, when you're going through, when you're going through items, I've always had the best luck with pulling out the best items first. Okay. And I feel like a lot of people overthink it. It's like, Oh, I'll wait to the end and, because there are situations where when you do pull out the best items, they just want to buy, they want to keep the best items and they want to sell you the junk. Right. Right. They, right. It, right. Let's just say, for instance, if you've got a dollar, you know, you've got two dance co albums full of dollars and everything is, you know, good and better, but there's a 93 S and VF in there. Right. Right. And you, you, you obviously want to pay homage to the 93 S because it is, and especially being a VF for a shop, that's a, that's a pretty cool coin to buy in a shop, right? Yeah. A, cho a choice VF 93 S dollar. Yeah. Um, you want to make sure that you give the proper, you know, admiration for a coin like that, you know, and you want to be able to explain that to them and explain to them that that's, you know, one of the, you know, the key of the Cirque Morgan Dollar series. And you want to give them the history so they know that they're dealing with a coin guy, right? right. And you put your fair price on it and then you buy the rest of the book at, at what it's worth. And when you do that, you're establishing a connection with that customer. Now you're allowing that customer to know, I know what the hell I'm talking about. And I'm going to pay fair money because, you know, if this, this coin bids, you know, $4,400 gray sheet, I'm going to offer you 40,000. I'm going to offer you 4,000. I'm going to, I'll sell in the store for 4750 with a 10% buyback. You know, it's very easy for them to understand that, right? Yeah. It is truly easy. And I feel like a lot of people over, overthink coin dealers or they're trying to always like get an edge here and not right. set up, set a percentage in your mind of what you want to make when you sit down and take care of that customer. And I promise you, they will multiply like gremlins. Okay. 100%. Those customers will multiply like gremlins. If you just take care of them, when you try to like, you know, beat for $50 on the back right. end or try to get $25 here and try to just like, you know, scrap it up. I just, I've never liked that approach. Um, we frown upon it a lot here. You know, we have so many buyers now. Um, it's really hard um, to, to be inside every deal. But one thing I do do is I grade deals in the back. I'm like, a, you know, I'm like a teacher. Like when I get those, when those deals get bought, I'll sit there with a red pen and I'll go through things where I feel like they could have tried a little bit harder or, you know, maybe they tried a little too hard. 
Okay. Right. Um, right. You know, there's been instances where I've sent people checks for more money because I felt like we probably should have tried a lot harder or maybe they missed a mint mark. Absolutely. Um, you know, maybe, maybe they figured something for AU that I thought was a lot better than that or, or just, you know, whatever. Right. And it's just training, right? Constant training. And for you, right? You got to train yourself. You've got to, you've got to, you can only learn so much if you're buying proof sets, you know, modern proof sets and, you know, maybe a few dollar coins here and, and maybe, you know, some 90%. There's only so much you're going to learn, right? And that's why you got to go to those shows, right? And you've got to get those coins in your hand. You have to look at them. You've got to right. start dealing with people that you know and trust. And, and I, I think that's really the road that a lot of these young numismatists have taken to turn the hobby side into it to more of a business side of it. Right. Right. Absolutely. It's cutting their teeth in the coin shop and then hitting those shows, small regional shows, you know, trying to do business. Because if you go to a regional show, you're going to find a lot of people there for liquidity. You're going to find a lot of smaller shops there looking to refill their checkbook, reload their checkbook for the next buying week or for the, you know, for the Christmas holidays or for whatever it is. And you're going to be able to make deals there. Right. Yeah. And, you know, so, so support your local regional coin shows, support your local coin show, of course support the coin clubs, be active in coin clubs. Um, let people in the coin club know that you're a guy who gives liquidity, right? And you give it at a very fair price. Uh, you're going to stay very, very busy. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. You're going to stay very busy. So what's your plan? So what do you know? So what, what is a guy that's at 22 who's accomplished a lot? You've graduated. Um, you've done a lot of good things. You're moving into Washington, DC. What is your professional career look like and how much of that involves coins? I would love it to involve as much coins as absolutely possible. Um, there is nothing that brings me more joy, except for my fiance, than going to and my family, um, than going to look at a fresh coin collection. I found uncirculated 1893 Carson City Morgans, two of them in the same collection, some a whole horde of six 1926 ten dollar Indians, four graded 66, a 65 plus, and a 65. Um, 93S Morgans, 89, all, all these kind of things that I would have never expected to be out in the wild. And if you, I think I found if you do a really good job and you're really honest with people and they feel very comfortable, um, that just like you said, word about what you do can spread like wildfire. Um, I've been up to Boston, down to Virginia, I'm going to Philadelphia tomorrow um, to look at a coin collection. I will never ever hopefully in my entire life pass up the opportunity to go look at a coin collection at least give somebody the idea of what it's worth and talk with them about it and yeah. if not purchase it yeah um but of course those things are few and far between sometimes and sometimes you're overloaded with people who want to have you come look um but i'm going to be a consultant in dc starting in late october um i'm very unsure about how much of a time commitment that will elicit from me on a weekly basis yeah. um, but i'm really hoping that on weekends and maybe on some vacations i'll be able to to continue to deal with the people that i love so much in this hobby people like you who are incredibly great and people who are my age who are also incredibly great but maybe not as experienced um we're just not as experienced as you and i think but that's I, why we're doing this right that's why right. we have the, the the podcast right Right. Yeah. You guys, you guys are phenomenal as far as the knowledge that you are putting forward in this podcast. Um, I think the last piece that that really is one of my bigger issues that you talk about so much, I saw it with Kurt and I've heard it continually mentioned, um, is this notion of liquidity, because it's when you're dealing and buying somebody's entire coin collection, the good and the bad, right. having that liquidity not only allows you to feel a lot more comfortable when buying a coin collection, but also allows you to offer somebody you know, frankly, more money for the coins that kind of fall under the radar when there's those good ones. And then there's those 1960s mint sets and those, right. you know, 90% silver and, you know, Morgan dollars that are in your VF to AU range. Right? But you so, have to buy, right? Because you can make you good spreads on them, you right? And you want to, yeah. right? But, right? So I got a curveball for you. So say, say, um, say somebody calls you and they've got a quarter million dollar coin collection that they're really, they're, they want to sell. They like you. What would you do? Who would you call? How would you handle that quarter million dollar deal that you know that you can buy and probably, you know, sell for 10% profit? Right. Who would you call? As far as, as far as another deal or as, as far, far as, as liquidity? I mean, yeah, you're going to have to write a right. check for a quarter million bucks, right? So who are you, who are you calling to get that deal done? Here's really honestly what I would do. I think I'm fortunate enough in my career at this point to handle something like that as far as buying it. Okay. Um, but 
I would go and I would do an itemized evaluation, sit down with the person and, and make them feel comfortable, make myself feel comfortable with the coins that they have. You know, I itemize to an extent, as I'm sure you do, but you can't necessarily itemize everything in a collection of that caliber. Of course. If it was graded, it would be excellent, but probably I assume a $250,000 graded collection, they might already have a connection in the coin industry aside from myself. But so maybe not. Like, so wait, so, not. so listen, don't give these people too much credit. <laughs> I've seen a lot of people, no, listen, honestly, True. Ethan, I've seen a lot of people lose deals because they assume that someone else is as smart as they are. And I'm telling right. you, that's really a lot of times not the case. It's just okay. not, it's just not the case, yeah. right? So you can, don't do that because it's easy. You're like, oh, well, I'm assuming if this guy's a quarter million dollar coin collection, obviously he must have someone he's deals with, but you might, you might not know You're that. He might right. not like that guy. That guy might've charged him too much money. He's looking to right. get out. So again, my question is, and I guess where I'm trying to lead you to is that you've Please. got to, you've got to build dealer alliances. You've got to build people that you can, you know, with like the 10 Indians and six, like that's, that. Th those are coins for me. Like, I love those coins. Right. Those are coins right. that are, you know, 16,000 to 22,000, depending on what they look like. And, um, you know, those are, those are things that I would love to be offered. My, my point would be, is that make sure that you build a network of two or three guys that you feel confident in that are going to give you consistent and fair numbers that are not going to make you look like a jerk. Right? right. Where you can dial down 10% and say, Hey, I'm going to figure myself in for 10 points and I'm going right. to flip it to Kenny. Right. I'm going to, I'm going to call Kenny and see what he'll pay. Or, you know, yeah. prior, prior to I'll do the evaluation. I'll tell them, Hey, I'm going to go home tonight and work up numbers. Right. You know, you shoot me a few numbers and shoot me a few photos and say, Hey, Kenny, this is what I want to do. Um, let's just say for instance that, you know, maybe most people don't have $250,000 of liquidity to be able to write a check. Um, right. There are, there are things that I know of some really good dealers around this country who would help uh, a young numismatist buy a cool sure. deal like that to really yeah. cut their teeth and really put themselves on the map. So what I'm saying is that make sure that when you guys are, don't ever limit yourself to money or to knowledge. Okay. Because there is a, there are tons of guys out here. We had Jeff Garrett on, on, on our yeah. podcast last week, yeah. who has been, who's famous yeah. for, um, for helping some of these younger guys buy a deal. I myself uh, have done that plenty of times and, and, and I'm always open to do deals that make sense. Um, for any number. And I think there's a lot of other guys other than myself. So I'm not just plugging myself, but I'm saying, but don't ever limit yourself to a deal because that deal could be the deal that puts you on the map. Right. Right. right? Can I ask you a question Go. about, about the liquidity? Go. Um, I think a problem for me is you want to treat somebody who's trusting you with their collection, letting you into their home with all the respect in the world, because of honestly, course. it feels like a blessing that they'd call me, you know, versus somebody who might have a shop. Right. Um, so I'm always tempted to give them absolutely as much money as I can. They say, is this even worth a thousand? And they walk out with a $20,000 check and I feel right. really good because they're gleaming with happiness and they're going to talk to their friend about me maybe. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you want to offer somebody so much for their coins that they're as happy as possible. And then at, on the back end of that, you want to get retail for your coins. Of course, what that happens to me is you end up with more coins and then more and then more. Right. And you don't have that liquidity yeah. because I'm, I'm like, oh, did I, I paid too much for that. And yeah, now you missed rule. Yeah, you missed rule number one. Right. Rule number one is don't fall in love with your coins. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's definitely, hard, isn't it? Well, you have to. Well, then listen, this is that transition from being a hobbyist to a dealer. Right. Right. And you can see them. You go to the divorce floors, and I'm not going to name names, but you can see guys that have one or two cases. They want a lot of money for their coins because they're either retired engineers, retired oil and gas, retired X, and <laughs> yeah. they are diehard collectors that are retired and that are now taking their taking their collecting on the road. And they're like quasi dealers that want retail for their coins, but they're really nice coins, right. and um, and that's how they built their customer base. So. If you're going to be that guy, great. I mean, more power to you. If you're going to be a volume buyer, uh, like I would consider right. myself to be a volume buyer, um, then I fall in love with about 1% of the coins that I see. Right. And that's all that 1831 caps quarter that you guys are clearly in love with. Uh, yes. That was a great coin. Yeah, it's a 38 cap bus quarter. Oh, um, yeah. It's, it's, it's a coin. 66. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's in today's modern, you know, in today's standards, it's probably, a 67 plus. It's one of the most full struck quarters I've ever seen. Um, I bought that coin about six years ago and I've just never, I've just never, ever found a good reason to sell it. So why? So, yeah, exactly. Why? I saw those, those shipwreck gold bars that y'all have, I think on Instagram, Yeah, you just have some amazing stuff. I, I don't know if I'd ever be able to sell something like that, but at yeah. the end of the day, 
that's yeah. kind of why I've had these issues with liquidity as far as getting things sold because you fall in love. You're like, oh, can I let that go for this amount of money? It's worth so much more. Yeah. But, but that's where you build, you have to build the right customer where you're only just, right. they're, they're holding it for now, but they'll think of you when they want to sell it later on. And that's how we've done yeah. very well. Yeah, that's a good point. Because we place coins with customers and then we get to see them in 10 years later, five years later, because right. uh, you never know. I mean, we've, how many things that we've placed with our customers, gold certificate sets, uh, even watches and coins that we've been able to buy right back and, you know, just Peace staying dollar, with the market, right? Peace just, dollar set, Morgan dollar set, right. you know, 1893 gold proof set with a right. silver type in it. Yep. You know, we, when we buy the really cool things, kind of like what you're talking about, we place them with customers with the intentions like, here, you're going to make money on this. I'm going to, there'll be a day I call you and say, hey, I want to buy this back. And obviously it's right. up to you if you want to or not, but it just gives them some confidence that what they're buying is good, right? Because right. we'll, you Absolutely. know, I sold a $17.94 here recently. Um, I could have sold that coin and paid my customer a profit literally three different times in the last six months. And he right. just hasn't wanted to sell it. Um, so it's a way for you to be able to keep the coins close, right? right. It's not like you're putting them in auction and you're never going to see them again, or you sell it right. to a dealer at a coin show. You're never going to see it again. You, you build a cool customer base and you're right. very, you know, keep, keep 10% of what you really like and really right, right. start working on placing that. And if you do a good job, then increase that to 20% and then 30%. And right. now you're, now you're building, you know, and I've said it to Matthew and we, we, we say it a lot, but you want to create that farm to table type of business model, right? Where you're cultivating the coins, right? You're getting them from point A and you're literally taking them to, them to retail, but you're charging them both very fair margins because you're putting them together basically. And you make hopefully 15 to 20 points in the middle. And now right. you know where that cat bus quarter is. You right. know where that $94 is. You know where that, you know, the, the, the $95 and three plus is at. You know where these things are now, right? And you're starting right. to really build a good network. And those are the guys I've seen that want to do that business model. I've seen them do really, really well with that type of, you know, with that mindset. So I think that's important. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, I love it. Any oh, other, man, any other... On. Any other questions you got for us today? One more that I've been really fascinated in what you guys do and what I've been trying to look to do as I move forward a little bit. You talked about your your addition into your business model of watches and jewelry and sterling silver and how that's allowed you to maybe grow a little bit, but sure. also move yourself through the market when certain things are hot and certain things are cold and then be able to pivot back by having that knowledge base. Do you feel like you built your knowledge base into those other areas as strong as it is in coins and that you're able, and that's why you're able to deal in them? Um, or if it's more, you have to be a little bit more conservative, but it's good to have in your toolbox because it's something that I've struggled with with watches in particular where authenticity is an issue. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it comes down to your reputation, right? Right. Um, if I say publicly that we're going to start doing something, people know that we're going to do it with a, with a certain level of a certain prowess, right? We're going to. We're not going to half a it, right? We're not going to, uh, we're not going to do it 50%. We're going to do it full war. And I believe that once you build that, that, that your name, that, that people can, can kind of, they can put it together. Like, Hey, these guys do things right. Um, you know, buying sterling silver flatware is not a science. It's a, right. it's a percentage, right? right? right. Um, buying scrap gold is not a science, it's a percentage. Right. Buying a Rolex is a little bit, a little bit different, right? You have to have some authentication skills. Okay. Right. Um, but then on top of it, you need to know some of the basics, right? You need to get a Rolex book that, that tells you what case numbers are, are matched with what, um, what movement numbers. Right. And you need right. to just, and listen, and a lot of people get scared of it, but believe it or not, it's actually simple. You, you know, for a day, I'd love to hear that. I love well, to hear I'm that. just saying for, for a day, just there's only so many movements that match the date just, and there's photos right. all over the world online. It's not hard. I mean, if you wanted to really put together a buy, a buy Rolex index, like a folder, just like a little one and a half inch binder with photos and like, you know, highlights, it might take you a week to compile that data. Right. And you know, literally after your first five or six watches, you're going to really start to learn a lot more than anybody else because people are freaking lazy. And they're not going to do it themselves, right? They want to look at it and go, oh, I can't learn that. Right. Well, that's, you don't want to deal with people who say, I can't learn that because I just, those are people I just tend not to mess with. It's the people who say, yeah, you know what? Let's figure it out. That's, those are the type of people I like. So if that's your person and that's the, your reputation that you've built, I don't care if you sell uh, uh, pinwheels, 
you're going to do a great job, right? Because you're going to figure it out, right? You're going to push the boundary. You're going to push the envelope. You're going to innovate and you're going to stand so alone differently because people are really, some people are just too freaking lazy to do it themselves. Absolutely. Right. So yeah. that's my best advice. Don't be lazy, <laughs> right? Don't be yeah. lazy and do what other people are not willing to do. And you're going to be awesome. Yeah. And, and I could speak to the watches. So the watches, I would say, you're just looking really for inconsistencies. Um, you're, you're, you're taking a watch that they build and they make in mass production and you're yeah. comparing it to a watch that they hand put together. It takes a lot longer process to do. So, um, when you know the movement numbers, you know, you know, the right movements for the right watches, you know, the right things to look for. And, um, I mean, it's just like looking at a counterfeit coin. You know, once you know the diagnostics and you can break it down, <laughs> then you can really, then, you know, you have a right, the right, you know, a real coin or a real, or a real, real, real watch. But there's only one way to do that. Yep. You right. See so much. I well, it's, it's just do yeah. it. You have to just do, do it. it. Right. You're going to have to right. take a risk. You're going to have to buy a watch. It's going to have to be uncomfortable. You're going right. to be nervous for three or four days. If it's real, you're going to yeah. overnight it to us, or you're going to send photos. And that's another good thing. You have plenty of good resources. You can send it to Matt and myself. There's plenty of watch guys in coin dealers, up in coin dealers, uh, in other various groups. That I feel like, um, would give you a fair shake and say, Hey, listen, right. You know, I would be careful for this, 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 and I would pay this if everything checks out right. And one thing I can tell you, a great piece of advice when you're buying a diamond or a watch or a piece of jewelry is you, is you give them a bid based upon inspection. Right. Okay. So you have to preface if everything goes good with what we believe it to be. So if you're not there to visually inspect it yourself, Right. Then your caveat is based upon inspection, okay? Right. Because you might buy a diamond. You can't necessarily buy a diamond off a of GIA cert, although GIA is the mecca in terms of 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 liquidity for for certs and for diamond in the diamond world. GIA is the standard grading service. Um, and nine times out of ten, you can get a good base value off of the cert, but you need to see how that diamond matches in hand with that cert. Absolutely. Right. right. It's no different than um, if you're putting together a high end typeset for a client and he wants a uh, let's just take he wants a 81 CC dollar in seven. That's what he's missing out of this CC set. OK. And he yeah. wants to do all the semi keys in seven and he wants to do the better coins in three. Um, so, you know, this 67 that you brought that you got in and the photo looks fine. But then once you get it, it's got a light little scratch that maybe one of the graders missed or you know, do you send right. that coin back? Do you, you know, does your customer say, Hey, actually, you know, I don't want this coin. It's got a scratch on it. Um, right. you've got to be picky. Okay. Um, with it's no different than watches and diamonds. It's just, there's so many other variables with those. You could buy the watch, the watch could be great, but then it could have the wrong bracelet number. Right. It could have the wrong movement. It could yeah. have a different case back. Um, the dial may not be original. The The bezel could not be right. original Rolex. There's so many different things. But right. again, instead of like stressing yourself out saying, oh, there's too many variables. I'm not going to do it. You say, hey, no F it. I'm going to learn it. Right? right. And I'm going to be the, it doesn't take long. It could take no. you two or three weeks to figure that stuff out. But I'm telling yeah. you guys just won't do it. And that's why there's more money for guys like us. So, you know. Yeah. I want to use this platform to tell people stop being lazy and get, and get out there and take some risk. But at the same time, if you don't, we're, we'll take care of it. Don't worry, <laughs> don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> you guys are the absolute best. I try, I try to be the guy in coins. I hope one day to be the guy for some other things, but you guys are the guy and you're a real inspiration to people who are in my position. I want well, you to know that. Hey man, I appreciate that. I, yeah. and, and we appreciate that collectively yes. and uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Like I said, anytime okay. you have any questions, man, reach out, you know, we're always available. Uh, you've got my number, you've got my email, make sure you use it. Uh, guys, this is Ethan. Thank you very much for coming on. We appreciate it. Keep it running, yeah. you know, keep it going. Kick some butt out there, Ethan. Thank you. It was a pleasure meeting both of you. Thank you so much for having me on. Hey man, our pleasure. Peace Take well. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.